Larry Fink is easily the most controversial man in finance. It seems like the wider world is beginning to wake up to Larry Fink and his claim to infamy, BlackRock. A gargantuan company, mind-bogglingly big. In 2021, it was reported that BlackRock managed $10 trillion for clients. To put that into comparison, the third largest economy in the world, Japan, is only worth five. A company the size of a nation, yet accountable to none. Larry enjoys a position of enormous power. One his critics say he abuses to no end, so long as it boosts profits. In recent years, however, Larry Fink has been increasingly vocal in changing things for the better. He champions a greener, more sustainable future and is personally leading the charge. Has Larry turned a new leaf and become a powerful force for good? Or is all this a publicity stunt? A poor cover-up for a man used to dealing in the dark, now dragged kicking and screaming into the light? While some ponder the duality of man or the meaning of life, Larry Fink doesn't concern himself with such trivial matters. Larry wrangles with a far more important question. How can he become one of the most powerful men in the world? How can he, the lowly son of a shoemaker, be spoken of in the same breath as presidents and world leaders? The obvious route is of course politics. Naturally, Larry enrolls in UCLA to study a BA in politics political theory. Then, in one of those funny moments, something seemingly insignificant changes everything. In his final year, Larry takes some extra classes in real estate, and he loves it. Larry no longer wants to be president, but a real estate tycoon. Then, after receiving his MBA in 1976, he isn't entirely sure what he wants to do, but his goal still remains the same – greatness. So like most insatiable finance graduates, he heads to the place where legends are born – Wall Street. The thing is, Larry doesn't know why legends come from Wall Street, nor the gauntlet waiting for him when he gets there. If you are already on Wall Street, an ambitious chimp looking to make it big in the finance world, or you are a silverback chad pursuing your studies and pursuing your megalomaniac business plans, you might be familiar with these situations. Your daily schedule is packed with micro tasks and your to-do list is full of stuff you would love to outsource. You would need an ambitious and intelligent junior chimp to help you with daily operations of running your life so that you can conquer new net worth levels. Luckily, you can hire someone like that. It's not called a chimp, but it's a virtual assistant at Wing. Assistants provide personalized assistance to busy individuals and entrepreneurs. Their team is dedicated to helping you streamline your workload and optimize your productivity. From scheduling appointments and managing emails to conducting research and organizing your to-do list, Wing virtual assistants can tackle any task with ease. Plus, with their flexible plans and affordable pricing, they can tailor assistance to fit your budget, even if you're a brokey. Whenever I had a question, customer support was able to help within minutes. Needless to say, I always felt valued as a customer, as a true GigaChat should. Don't let a busy schedule hold you back. Click the link in the description to learn more about Wings virtual assistant services and how they can help you take your net worth to the next level. Now, 34 years old, Larry is at a crossroads. He spent his entire career, almost a decade, working for First Boston, an investment bank in New York. But he's just made a critical mistake, one that'll do more than just crease his tidy plans for world domination. Let's rewind, shall we? He started working in 1976 at First Boston's bond trading department. Although as a Jew, he faces the xenophobia of the era, Wall Street is blind to creed and color. It's purely money-tocratic. If you can make money, 
that's all that matters. It's a little bit like Giga University. And oh boy, did Larry find his calling. He printed money by the millions. How? Three words, mortgage-backed securities. Words that sent shivers down the back of Wall Street today, but in the 1980s, they are all the rage. Larry helped create this instrument, popularize it, and of course, profit immensely off of it. He had towering success at First Boston. Within two years, he was anointed managing director, the youngest ever in the firm's history. Furthermore, he had caught the attention of his higher-ups. Larry heard through the grapevine that he was even being considered for CEO. Of course, with such sudden success, Larry's ego ballooned. He started to rub people the wrong way and in his own words, quote, I was a jerk. Like King Midas, everything he touched turned gold. Wall Street puts men on pedestals, but it tears them down just as quickly. One misstep is all it takes. Larry, in an effort to secure the gilded crown of CEO, makes a huge gamble. Confident that interest rates are going to rise, he positions the firm to profit accordingly. He made sure the firm was insured in case he ended up being wrong. So, when Larry's great gamble goes wrong and interest rates plunged, Larry merely shrugs. He had anticipated this possibility and prepared for it. Or at least he thought he had. Now imagine the horror when his colleagues tell him he'd made a mistake. He'd hatched his trade on incorrect numbers. A simple mistake, but a costly one. 100 million dollars gone. Despite bringing in at least a billion dollars to the firm throughout his career, First Boston's Princeling becomes an outcast within the firm and not long after, he's jobless. Larry had always gotten ahead by taking more risk than others and ultimately failed for the same reason. For the first time, Larry carefully considered risk, weighed it in the palm of his hand, a potent drug as intoxicating as it is dangerous. Larry had learned an excruciatingly painful lesson, but he intended to use it to his advantage. He would become a professional in managing risk. With newfound determination, Larry builds the A-team of traders. Not easy to do, mind you, when you're the leper of Wall Street. But he manages to build his team nonetheless. Eight all-stars in total. Now all he needs is financial backing. Also surprisingly hard to do, after having just lost 100 million dollars. That's when Larry comes into the orbit of legendary financier and co-founder of Blackstone, Steven Schwartzman. <clears throat> if you wanted to learn more about him, I may have made a video on him. For a 50% stake in the business, Schwartzman bankrolls 5 million dollars to the fledgling business, named Black. Blackrock? Wait a minute, Blackstone and Blackrock? Yes, I know, not the most creative bunch. Still, Fink's idea of building a business to manage risk pays off, despite clearly being a stressful job. Larry and Steven's risk and asset management firm starts making money within months and in a year they are already managing billions of dollars. However, it isn't long before the pair butt heads. Larry wants to draw talent, the best of the best to BlackRock, and he decides to offer up ownership of the company as a lure. But he wants it to come entirely out of Steven's part. Larry insists that he and his team do all the work, it's only fair that Steven cough up some ownership. But in an act Steven later describes as a heroic mistake, Steven stands his ground in his own words. I believed that once you signed something, you stuck to it. Even though by 1994 BlackRock managed more than 50 billion dollars, the two parties won't budge, neither back down, and so the two finance magnets split. Steven focuses on building Blackstone and Larry Blackrock. Today the two sibling companies are both expansive empires and both men billionaires. After Blackrock goes public in 1999, it enters an era of rapid growth and expansion. To realize his grand vision of Blackrock becoming a sprawling empire, Larry goes on a shopping spree in the early 2000s. With each company they absorb, Blackrock grows tremendously, with their assets under management rising dramatically each passing year. Still, it's in 2009 
Morgan, where Larry will acquire the thing that will make BlackRock a world power. Mortgage-backed securities. Remember those? Larry, the kingpin of these kinds of securities in the 80s, had since learned his lesson. For the last 20 years, he'd been busy nurturing his risk management empire, extending its reach, bolstering its influence. But MBSs hadn't conveniently disappeared. In fact, they'd cast a spell over American finance and promptly corrupted it. If you want to learn more about MBSs, there are great detailed videos, just like this one. Larry, familiar with the sting of MBSs, had limited BlackRock's exposure to these volatile securities. Wall Street, on the other hand, had gorged themselves on these mortgage-backed securities without really understanding how rotten they were. Huge financial giants woke up to the realization that the billions they had invested in these assets were evaporating before their eyes. As they watched Bear Stearns lose 90% of its value and the titan Lehman Brothers become the Titanic, everyone began to panic. This spelled disaster to many, but opportunity to a few. Companies run conservatively, like JP Morgan, managed to scoop up sickly competitors at a bargain, as you can learn in our Jamie Dimon biography. Larry didn't intend to miss the party. Barclays Bank bought part of the collapsed Lehman, thinking they were getting a steal, until they ran the numbers and figured out that they'd bought the financial equivalent of nuclear waste. The situation rapidly deteriorated and Barclays needed to raise some serious cash fast. So they brought out the crown jewel, BGI or Barclays Global Investors. Within BGI was the iShares ETF, the largest issuer of ETFs worldwide at the time. Larry refused to let the opportunity pass. One of the few cash flush companies left. BlackRock bought BGI out for $13.5 billion, although rarely spoken of. It's the deal that cemented BlackRock as the world's biggest asset manager. As if that wasn't enough, passive ETFs like iShares would grow phenomenally popular over the following years. Actively managed ETFs struggled and continue to struggle to match the returns of low-cost passive ETFs. With a stranglehold over passive ETFs right before their boom as an investing vehicle, Larry Fink must have been feeling pretty pleased with himself. On top of well-timed and even better priced acquisitions, BlackRock stands out from its competitors. Investors, now rabid to find a safe harbor for their cash, crowd the relatively unscathed BlackRock and beg them to take their money. If all that isn't enough, these investment tools like mortgage-backed securities, the ones wrecking havoc on firms across the world, well, they're so darn complicated. Companies stuck with these investments struggle to make sense of them. Only a select few truly understand them and Larry Fink suddenly becomes a very popular man. Everyone wants Larry to take a look at their investment portfolios and lend his wisdom for a price, of course. Even the Fed trying to patch the pieces of a crumbling economy and stop the bleeding, have Larry on speed dial and call him in to consult on the restructuring and buyouts of collapsing banks. While American finance takes years to rebound, Larry has managed to capitalize on the crisis. He emerges with friends in high places, more money than ever and what he's always wanted, the influence of a president, a company like a world power, without a single campaign nor a single vote true power. Larry has always wanted to be important and now that he's more important than he ever dreamed of, he's loving it. BlackRock and its handler Larry Fink have undeniable power and sway over institutions and nations. Consequently, they've recently been thrust into the eye of the public and by and large condemned. But is it deserved? The largest criticism is simply BlackRock's sheer size, 10 trillion dollars under management. God, that's a lot of money. And yet, it's meaningless. Think of it like bank deposits. The bank doesn't own that money, they simply manage it on behalf of clients. A better measure of might could be total assets or the total value of everything the company owns. As of 2022, BlackRock's total assets amounted to 117 billion, a far cry of 10 trillion. In comparison, Google's total assets were 365 billion, in essence three times the size. But Kevin, doesn't BlackRock own chunks of the biggest companies 
in the world? Technically, yes. But it's the clients who really own the shares and thus the voting rights. BlackRock does however admit it can vote on behalf of clients, sometimes without any client input. Another popular argument is BlackRock's involvement with China. In August 2021, it was the first mutual fund ever to set up shop in China. Beyond the messy ethics of investing in China as a whole, BlackRock had invested in two companies, iFly Tech and Hick Vision, both surveillance companies that have been blacklisted by the US government for human rights abuses against Uyghurs. In 2018 and 2019, BlackRock came under fire for their huge investments in companies with large carbon footprints. At one point, they owned more oil and gas than any other investment management company. They've also been denounced as a huge investor in companies that drive the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. In 2022, The Guardian named Fink one of the top climate villains for this very reason. Then again, in defense of Larry, he's also been very vocal to improve things. In response to this criticism, Larry added ESG ETFs so that clients have the option to invest in only environmentally and socially conscious companies if they want. Larry himself issued a stern warning to companies he invests in to go green or risk losing BlackRock's support. Of course, he did that because he is a great human being, not because his LPs feel the pressure of ESG activism. To his credit, he hasn't backed down, even when he's lost certain investors like the state of Florida to the tune of $2 billion in the pursuit of a greener future. Now some vehemently oppose ESG investing as well, for a number of reasons, saying it's a way to push vogue capitalism and subversively force companies to adopt certain policies. While the court of public opinion has been quick to condemn BlackRock, in the end the question of whether Larry and BlackRock are evil or not is unproductive. Larry Fink has built an empire by relentlessly tailoring his business and its products around what clients want. Despite its flaws, BlackRock allows clients to invest in everything, from arms manufacturers to surveillance companies operating in communist dictatorships to those innovating to fight climate change. While many call for regulatory oversight, for a tighter grip on this behemoth of an asset manager and an answer to how one man could build such a staggering business, at the end of the day, the most powerful way to change BlackRock, or any business for that matter, is to put your money where your mouth is. Investors ultimately decide whether or not to invest ethically. BlackRock and companies like it simply respond in kind.